This film introduces the music of a composer all too often forgotten nowadays. Léonce de Saint-Martin was born in Albi in the southwest of France in 1886, making him an exact contemporary of the legendary French organist Marcel Dupré. His father was from a noble lineage, and in due course Léonce would succeed to the title Comte de Saint-Martin. His mother was a talented musician who fostered her young son's musical aspirations and gave him his earliest tuition at the piano. He discovered the organ when he was allowed to play Albi Cathedral's historic instrument on a visit one day, and by the age of 14 was deputising at the cathedral regularly in services. He had his heart set on a career as a musician, but his father had other ideas, insisting that he qualify in law. He did that and followed it with two years of military service before marriage at 22. When his father died and he became independent, he was encouraged by no less an authority than Vincent Dandy, co-founder of the Schola Cantorum in Paris, to leave the provinces and relocate to the capital, there to fulfil his ambitions as an organist. The timing of his arrival in Paris is crucial to understanding some of the criticism that later would be levelled at him when he succeeded Louis Vierne as organist of Notre Dame. In France at that time, study at the Paris Conservatoire was the only viable route to a professional music career. If you'd not studied there, no matter the reason why not, you were considered but an amateur. However, no one over the age of 25 was eligible to commence studies there, and so Léonce, through no fault of his own, did not qualify. Instead, through Dandy's help, he took organ lessons from the renowned Adolphe Marty, a pupil of César Franck and a teacher of Louis Vierne. During the First World War, he was called up for military service and won the Croix de Guerre. It was on leave from this military service in 1917 that he went to Notre Dame one Sunday and encountered Marcel Dupré for the first time. Dupré was deputising for Vienne and invited Saint-Martin to improvise, an interesting foreshadowing of what would happen when Saint-Martin met his own successor at Notre Dame more than three decades later. The two men immediately became friends, and after the war Dupré began to call on him regularly as a deputy. It's interesting in light of the way that Saint-Martin's reputation and skill as an organist became so tarnished later that Dupré said this of him. Saint-Martin represents what I would call the great tradition of cathedral organists. I remember the day just after the war of 1914-18 to 18 when I asked him, without warning, to improvise a sortie at Saint-Sulpice. The result was very much what I would have expected. Large forms, clear sonorities that filled the building, punctuated and phrased with authority, in a style that could not have been so polished had it not been interpreted by hands so sensitive and inspired. This is hardly a description of a poor player, and it comes from a fearsome critic. During the 1920s, Saint-Martin continued his studies with Marty, until he reached the point where Marty felt that he had nothing left to teach the young man. Believing him destined for greatness, Marty passed Saint-Martin on to Louis Vierne himself, the relationship between those two men soon became far more than merely that of teacher and pupil. They became close friends and trusted confidants, Vienne himself now calling on Saint-Martin regularly to deputise at Notre Dame. During this period, Léonce was organist of the Church of Notre Dame des Blancs Manteaux in the Marais district of Paris, and was also working as a cinema organist. The skills that he developed at this time for the creation of vivid programme music can be heard to wonderful effect in the next piece, his vivid depiction of the flight of the Hebrew people captive in Babylon. Composed in 1932, this is his paraphrase of Psalm 136.
The popular legend surrounding the Notre Dame succession of 1937 is that Saint-Martin, a mediocre amateur organist, used his social connections to get himself appointed as successor to Louis Vierne upon Vierne's death, having previously done much the same thing to get himself appointed as deputy organist against the wishes of Vierne. This caused a scandal following the posthumous publication of a letter from Vienne to the cathedral chapter, which had been copied to Les Amis de Lorgue, in which Vienne stated that he did not want Saint-Martin to succeed him automatically. Saint-Martin was not good enough, and there should be a competition. It was well known in Parisian organ circles at that time that Vienne's chosen successor was his student Maurice Duroufle. And indeed, three of the four organists who announced their candidacy for the expected competition, Jean Alain, Gaston Littes and Jean Langlais, the fourth being de Rouflet himself, agreed, according to later recollections recorded by Jean Langlais, to play badly on the occasion of the competition to ensure that de Rouflet was selected. In the event, the cathedral chapter refused to hold a competition. They offered the job to Saint-Martin, who accepted it. There was an outcry and Léonce was ostracised ever after from Parisian organ society. Whilst it is true that after 1937 Saint-Martin was practically persona non grata in the Parisian organ world, this is not quite so true of his reputation outside Paris. In the provinces he maintained a healthy concert schedule, including opening many significant organs around the country. The notion that he was a poor organist is therefore immediately problematic, because the reviews and the continuing invitations to perform are distinctly at odds with that idea. It appears to have been accepted without question in Paris, because Vienne had said it, and Vienne, of course, had the support of Les Amis de Lorgue in promoting his opinion of Saint-Martin from beyond the grave. No one, it seems, stopped to consider the extreme irrationality to which Vienne was prone in the last decade and a half of his life. He was emotionally and physically ill at that time, and because Saint-Martin was too honourable to defend himself publicly, only the pro vienne side of the story ever became known. When the chapter of Notre-Dame appointed Léonce de Saint-Martin as the official deputy organist in 1932, this was clearly a platform to eventual succession. Letters from the cathedral authorities survive among Saint-Martin's papers, which refer to him as being the designated successor to Vienne as organist titulaire. There was no objection at the time, either to this or to his being made the official deputy. He had a reasonably high profile. Every week throughout 1936 and 1937, he broadcast organ recitals live on radio from his apartment, and there is no surviving evidence of complaints regarding poor playing there either. He was composing and publishing interesting and worthwhile music, performing regularly in concerts and receiving warm words for his performances. He was successfully fulfilling his duties as titulaire at Notre Dame des Blancs Manteau, and when required he was deputising in Notre Dame where his playing was much appreciated by the cathedral clergy. Doesn't all of this seem rather at odds with the official story that he was a poor player? One big problem with that official version is that Vienne never actually said it. Let's not forget that Vienne had been Saint-Martin's teacher for a number of years. They had been close friends and colleagues, and Vienne had even dedicated the Andantino of the pièce de fantaisie to Saint-Martin. It would have been extremely bizarre for Vienne suddenly to declare, after all of that, that he had trained a bad organist. What Vienne's letter actually says is that he is concerned that the successor be an artist worthy of the premier basilica of France and capable of maintaining the great tradition that I have upheld. Now, Vienne certainly considered Saint-Martin unworthy by this time, but as we will see, this was due to mistaken opinions that had nothing to do with Saint-Martin's personal skill. The association Les Amis de Léonce de Saint-Martin has published a great deal of evidence to refute the popular view. In the closing years of his life, with regards to his opinions of Saint-Martin, it becomes clear that Vienne was being cruelly manipulated into irrational beliefs. But in fact, he never denigrated Saint-Martin's playing. As late as 1937, when he was unavailable to perform for a sacred music congress, he actually told the organiser, ask Saint-Martin, he knows my works thoroughly and performs them perfectly. The multiple tragedies of Vienne's life are well known. 
He's often described as tortured and melancholy, and today almost certainly he would be diagnosed as seriously depressed. He behaved erratically, he was deeply paranoid, he could be extremely vindictive, and a great friendship with Marcel Dupré had fallen apart when he accused Dupré of conspiring to deny him entry to the Légion d'honneur. That was then compounded when he learned that the title of Organist of Notre Dame had appeared on some of Dupré's concert posters. Vienne was jealous of Dupré's success, and in the same way when he saw Saint-Martin becoming successful and popular around the city of Paris, at a time when he himself was struggling to make ends meet financially and losing pupils, it's not surprising that he tarred Saint-Martin with the same brush with which he had previously tarred Dupré. He began to use Maurice de Rouflet as his preferred deputy at Notre Dame from 1929 onwards. But the choirmaster of the cathedral, Canon Louis Meret, complained that de Rouflet's improvisations were too quiet and ephemeral, and stated that he much preferred Saint-Martin's. The sequence of events that finally destroyed Saint-Martin's relationship with Vienne began in 1930. Vienne saw a press item about a film that mentioned Saint-Martin's having recorded some music for it at Notre Dame. Vienne had given permission for this on the condition that Saint-Martin play under an alias. Seeing that Saint-Martin had been identified, Vienne flew into a rage and began issuing ultimatums. He was writing to editors, instructing bailiffs, demanding redress and complaining to the cathedral chapter. Vienne came to believe, amongst other wild theories, that Saint-Martin was trying to have his console assistance dismissed, and stated that Saint-Martin was creating, quotes, an utterably insufferable atmosphere of discord, of suspicion, of conspiracy and of intrigue. Eventually, Vienne wrote to Saint-Martin, instructing him to ensure that they never met again, which effectively denied Saint-Martin any opportunity to defend himself. Vienne then sent an even more extraordinary letter to the chapter, forbidding them ever to mention Saint-Martin's name to him, on account of the fact that his doctor had told him that if they did so, Vienne would probably drop dead, and this would be their fault. So how could a minor problem have escalated so spectacularly and bizarrely? Clearly something very odd was happening. In the early days of the problems, Vienne could embrace Saint-Martin in church, but then apparently send him notes stating such pleasantries as, you are a pig, never see me again. Saint-Martin always refused to believe that Vienne really wrote all of those notes. Vienne, it should be remembered, was virtually blind, and so could only write letters slowly and very laboriously using a typewriter. That same typewriter could just as easily have been used by someone else. Is it possible a third party could have been deliberately making the situation between the two men worse? Sadly, for the fate of Léonce de Saint-Martin, it was common knowledge at the time that this was indeed the case. Madeleine Richepin was the daughter of a patron of Vienne. She was a pianist and aspiring singer, less than half his age, but they developed a close and deep friendship the precise nature of which has always remained unknown. What we do know is that she became his secretary, his impresario and his amanuensis, and she accompanied him on his 1927 American tour, singing in his concerts. The problem here is that it seems that Vienne, the great blind organist, also had a selected deafness problem when Madeleine sang. She attracted some stinging reviews, but Vienne insisted that these were all the works of people conspiring against him. Madeleine was highly ambitious to sing in America again, but Vienne refused to return on account of ill health, so she asked Saint-Martin to accompany her instead. Out of deference to his idolised teacher, Saint-Martin refused, and this sent her into a screaming rage one evening in his apartment. Now, of course, it's impossible to know what, if any, part she played in the disaster that almost immediately followed, but it was common knowledge that Vienne was entirely under her influence at that time, and letters survive in Saint-Martin's papers from people so horrified at her tirades about him that they felt obliged to tell her that her behaviour was unacceptable. Complaints were made frequently that Madeleine was using the organ loft of Notre Dame as her own personal salon, occasionally inviting visiting organists to play without reference to Vienne. The chapter was well aware of this. When a commission was convened in 1931 to investigate the condition of the Notre Dame organ, 
and Guerne apparently was not invited to participate whilst San Martin was. Canon Mere's comment on the matter, when questioned, was a despondent chercher la femme. It should be mentioned that at least one independent witness saw Vienne's invitation mailed with everyone else's, so somehow it vanished mysteriously. As chair of that commission, Charles-Marie Vidor wrote to Vienne asking him to come to the cathedral organ loft to be involved in the deliberations, but Vidor implored Vienne to come alone because he could not stand Madeleine. As Vienne's depression worsened in the 1930s, he came into increasing conflict with the Notre Dame clergy. Saint Martin's appointment as official deputy in 1932 came on recommendation from Vidor. No less an authority than Vidor was happy to advise the chapter of Notre Dame that they would not find anyone better skilled to fulfill the duties of deputy organist than Léonce de Saint Martin, who had been dismissed by Vienne at that point in favour of Durufle. The chapter overruled that dismissal and stated that they did not want de Rufle and preferred that Saint Martin deputise for Vienne when need arose. They could clearly see the reality of what was going on. Léos de Saint Martin never gave up hope of rectifying matters. He wrote to Vienne to defend himself, but Vienne ignored him and they never spoke again. Yet Saint Martin kept his high regard for Vienne and always believed that Vienne had been most cruelly manipulated. There is no evidence that he ever spoke an unkind word about his former teacher. When Vienne died, the chapter found itself with a choice. They could appoint the man who for over ten years had proven himself a quiet and faithful servant of the cathedral, little concerned with international recognition and not beset as Vienne was by one crisis after another. But this man had no conservatoire qualification, which was a problem. The chapter's alternative was that they hold a competition but everyone knew that that competition would be won by Girufle, who was guaranteed success pretty much just by turning up. There is no doubt that Girufle could have been an exceptional servant of the cathedral also, his earlier difficulties tailoring his playing to the requirements of the vast space within the building would have been worked out in time. But the chapter wanted Saint Martin. They could be forgiven for wanting peace to reign in the tribune at last, and their decision to appoint him was unanimous. The scandal that followed and the public outcry broke his heart. He tried on several occasions to resign the post, but the cathedral authorities refused to accept his resignation, insisting that he was the man for the job and that they wanted him to remain. Should he have accepted the job? Perhaps he didn't do the right thing. Hindsight is a wonderful thing, and we can look back now in the knowledge of what was in the content of Vienne's letter. Saint Martin, let it be remembered, did not know of the existence of this letter at the time. He was fully able to fulfil the duties of organist of the Cathedral of Notre Dame. He knew this, yet he also knew that in any competition he would be bound to lose. Ultimately, we can judge him how we will, but his decision was understandable.
The fallout from the 1937 succession was terrible for Saint Martin. Surviving correspondence and memoirs from contemporary musicians who can be relied upon to speak honestly, among them Auguste Fauchard, make clear that prior to Vienne's death it was widely known that Saint Martin was being wholly unfairly treated by his former teacher. However, following Vienne's death, it's understandable that there was a reluctance to speak ill of the dead, and the result of that reluctance was that a very one-sided version of the sorry story gained acceptance. But worse was to come. During the years of the Second World War, after France fell to Germany in 1940, the country was divided. Paris being in the occupied northern zone, Saint-Martin had to get used to the sight of Nazi soldiers on the streets of his beloved capital. And as an employee of the city in his role at Notre-Dame, he had to tolerate seeing the cathedral used for large-scale Nazi-sponsored events. As a proud Frenchman and a decorated former soldier, he hated this. But a 2007 book on Maurice de Rouflet published a particularly vicious and nasty slur that was completely untrue. The book, using information supplied by a member of de Rouflet's family, alleged that Saint-Martin was a collaborator and had been absent from Notre-Dame for most of the war and was banned from playing the organ for the Te Deum service attended by General de Gaulle on the occasion of the liberation of Paris in 1944. Saint-Martin's own biographer, Jean Gerard, was a member of the choir at Notre-Dame during those years and is one of Saint-Martin's last surviving pupils. He attests that Saint-Martin was at his post almost every Sunday and the book's suggestion that it was de Rouflet who played for the Te Deum is nonsense. Even had Saint-Martin been unavailable on that occasion, for whatever reason, it's highly unlikely given the history that de Rouflet would have been the one asked to play in his place and it's telling that de Rouflet's own memoirs make no reference to this occasion. It's also conveniently overlooked that de Rouflet himself had received some financial reward for his music from the puppet Vichy government, and Saint-Martin's own diary records that he went to Notre-Dame that day to play. In the event, he was evacuated from the cathedral when someone fired celebratory shots inside the building, and there was a power cut effect in the grand organ. The only organist who played that day was the choir organist, René Blain, who played the Orgue de Coeur. Saint-Martin's diary entry reads as follows. 26th of August 1944. Te Deum planned at Notre-Dame for 1630. General de Gaulle arrived at 1610. The clergy were not there to receive him. The cardinal held prisoner was released at 1800. The bells and the organ were mute. The power had been cut. Machine gun fire upon the general's arrival. I could not get back to my post. The Magnificat and a couplet of Je suis chrétien were sung. Saint-Martin was no collaborator, and on several occasions during the occupation he performed some extremely provocative works at the cathedral that could have got him into serious trouble with the authorities. But sadly, for those who just wanted another stick with which to beat him, he was an easy target. After the war, the crash of the Franc forced Saint-Martin to sell off his remaining property near Albi, and ultimately even his apartment in the Place des Vosges. His former housekeeper and her husband bought it and allowed the Saint-Martins to continue living there at a tiny rent. Even in the darkest times, he never once asked for his salary at Notre-Dame to be increased. His concert career resumed fairly successfully, and there was no shortage of invitations to perform. He played in Paris, but especially he was invited to perform in the provinces, where there seemed to be less stigma attached to his name. Wherever he performed, and these years saw concerts throughout Europe, the critics were often laudatory. It was during this period that he toured the UK, and he did perform in Edinburgh, for the Alfred Hollins Memorial Fund recital on Monday the 13th of May 1946 at St George's West. The quality of his playing is borne out by the recordings he made at Notre Dame around this time, and unsuccessful attempts were made to lure him to the USA and Canada for a tour that had originally been planned to take place in 1939. He was even offered a prestigious post in California, which would have removed him from the hostility of Paris and restored his financial security, but although he considered it, ultimately he could not bear to leave Notre-Dame. As in the years before 1937, there is little evidence here to support a claim that Saint-Martin was a thoroughly mediocre organist. Most leading Parisian organists around this time, with the exception of Marcel Dupré and Dupré's young protégé Jean de Messier, ignored him. But the fact that he dedicated works to Joseph Bonnet and André Marchal suggests that others may also have been kinder than is sometimes thought. In the early 1950s, Saint-Martin's health began to trouble him. His playing did begin to suffer at this time, and some of the amateur recordings made at services from this era attest to it. 
He never really recovered from a fall on ice in early 1954. However, he was delighted later that year when a nervous young man presented himself in the Tribune one Sunday and blurted out that he had heard so many bad reports of San Martin that he thought he'd better come and assess things for himself. San Martin saw the funny side of this gaffe immediately, and in an echo of what had happened when he himself had visited Marcel Dupré in the Tribune in 1917, San Martin invited his young visitor to improvise the offertoire. Immediately that he heard the resulting music, he knew that he'd found his successor. The young man was Pierre Cochereau. On the 10th of June 1954, Léonce de Saint-Martin died at home, four days after playing his final service at Notre Dame. He'd been taken to hospital, but when it was clear that there was no hope, Madame de Saint-Martin arranged for him to be taken home. At her request, that journey took him past the west front of the cathedral, illuminated in the night. How beautiful it is, he murmured. Marcel Dupré, Jean de Messieurs, and Pierre Cochereau were the only noted organists to attend his small funeral. Cochereau went on to record a number of his works, and was still playing them in concert twenty years later. I've been performing and recording Saint Martin's music for many years, and I've always been struck by how many people uh, seem to hear something in it that speaks to them very directly. I think that as a composer he was sort of born out of his time. He was writing music that was distinctly in a romantic mould um, at a time in the 20th century when everything was about the avant-garde. And if you weren't in the avant-garde and if you weren't pushing boundaries and if you weren't saying something that was entirely original in a, in a very new and original language, I think particularly in France, um, you you were sort of regarded as being um, an anachronism. And I think that the personal situation that he found himself in, the fact that he was so ostracised from organ society and uh, that people really weren't uh, willing to consider that he had something valuable to say, was a real tragedy for his music. It's never particularly bothered me um, that in terms of the harmonic language or the way in which the music is composed, there's nothing particularly original in it. Um, I've always found that that sort of question of originality and the need for originality is, uh, it's not something that I've ever really understood. I mean, for example, Schubert's music uh, wouldn't exist really without Beethoven. Um, and early Beethoven wouldn't exist without Mozart. You can hear distinct similarities with many composers' music in the music of other composers. And so I've read and heard many criticisms of Saint-Martin's music that it's very influenced by the music of Vienne or it's very influenced by the music of César Franck. I don't really see that that needs to be a problem. Um, I think that what he was able to demonstrate in his music was that he had a total understanding um, of the compositional techniques that were used by those other composers. Uh, uh, he was able to, to understand it, to pick it apart, to synthesize it, and to use it in a way that was enabling him to create works that were new and interesting but that in many ways and I find this when I perform his music in many ways was uh, is a very uh, direct musical language that speaks to people's hearts I mean we do hear in his works the prelude from the Sweet Cyclique for example certain parts of the Symphony Dominicale there are definite definite echoes very close echoes of the music of the M um, but it's it's sort of constructed in a way that people somehow find more approachable a lot of the time. He would never, ever have considered himself to be an organist, uh, you know, up there on a par with Louis Vienne or Marcel Dupré. He was really unfortunate in so many ways in his life, but I think one of the ways in which he was really unfortunate was that he was a very good organist born into an age and working in a place where he was surrounded by brilliant organists, he was surrounded by geniuses. Um, and it must have been extremely difficult uh, to feel that you had any sort of breathing room when you had uh, working around you in, in, in churches that were just a stone's throw away. Marcel Dupré at Saint-Sulpice, 
Chateau uh, Namir at Saint Clotilde, Bonnet at Saint Eustache, uh, Vienne at Notre Dame. There were all of these names, Vidor, uh, Saint Sulpice, um, in the early days. These people were superstars of the organ world, and he would never have put himself up there on a, on a par with them. But that doesn't mean that he didn't have something valuable to say. It certainly doesn't mean for me that his that his music doesn't deserve to be played. Especially the thing that one of the things that has always really bothered me is how many works by other composers who it's a terrible term to use, but if we want to use the term the sort of second tier um, of Parisian organ composers, how many works by those composers we still know, we still know the music of Théodore Dubois, we still know the music of Eugène Gigou, we still know the music of Léon Buellman, uh, and we, we still know and play these works and we respect these composers and we give them the credit that they are absolutely due, whilst at the same time not arguing even for a moment that they were producing music that was on a level or on a par with the organ symphonies of Louis Vienne, for example. And yet, for some reason, Saint-Martin doesn't fall into that category. People don't know his music. People haven't heard his works. It seems to me to be something that's really wrong about that. And if you want the evidence for why it's wrong, you've only got to listen to the music, because everything is in there. That's what it's all about. It's about the notes that he wrote.